Good morning. Good morning. That's good. Um, my name is Dawn Purvis, and I'm chair of Healing Through Remembering. And for those of you who are not familiar, Healing Through Remembering uh, is an organisation that was established in 2001. It is an extensive cross-community organisation made up of members holding different political backgrounds, including loyalist, Republican, police, army, victims, church leaders, community workers, political activists, academics and journalists. We work together on a, a common goal of how to deal with the legacy of the past as it relates to the conflict in and about Northern Ireland. And we feel very strongly that unresolved grievances and wrongs relating to the conflict continue to contribute to the current lack of trust between communities and political parties and create real obstacles to building a, a peaceful settlement here. Uh, in order to pin political progress, the past must be addressed as part of the transition from conflict to peace and a more stable future. Healing Through Remembering has demonstrated through its work to date that dialogue and debate can lead to resolution and agreement without loss of political face or compromising your own principles. We believe that a, a stable, peaceful and shared future cannot be built unless we make peace with our past. And to this end, a lot of our work in facilitating dialogue and discussion is based in communities and across communities in different sectors. We've produced a number of reports as a result of discussions amongst our members and in the wider community, including the ethical principles of storytelling and narrative work, acknowledgement and its role in preventing future violence, and making peace with the past options for truth recovery regarding the conflict in and about Northern Ireland. And I believe there's a, a copy of the executive summary in your conference pack and there are full copies available at reception. All of our reports, and I would encourage you to go to our website, all of our re reports are available to download from our website. Over uh, the years that we've been in existence, we have developed a number of programmes aimed at furthering the debate on how we deal with the past. And our current uh, P3 funded programme, Voyager, is delivering workshops across the country and in the border counties, enabling people to participate in that wider debate. And if you would like to organise a workshop of your own, I did offer Frank Mitchell and UTV one this morning, or more information on our Voyager programme, please do get in touch. As an organisation, Healing Through Remembering recognise the importance of using research to inform our discussions. And we're very pleased to be a partner in this Arts and Humanities Research Council funded project with Queen's University and the Transitional Justice Institute at the University of Ulster, looking at amnesties, prosecutions and public interests and its relevance to our society and transition to peace. These are very difficult and complex issues that have come up in many of our discussions at Healing Through Remembering. And those discussions are uncomfortable and challenging and for some people can be very painful at times. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't talk. In fact, I would say that the more uncomfortable the conversation, then the more we need to have it. It is through these discussions, <coughs> excuse me, that a greater understanding of the issue and a greater understanding of those involved in the discussions is gained. And this leads often to a much better informed debate on the past and how we should deal with it, as well as much better relationships between those who are engaging. This conference is important as it brings together all of those involved in what we call the tapestry of truth recovery mechanisms that currently exist in Northern Ireland. Those who may be affected by those processes and academic researchers in what I hope will be an open and honest discussion. <coughs> Excuse me. As I said, I do understand that these are difficult issues and many of you will have strongly held views and opinions and I respect your right to hold those views. My hope for today is that we can all leave here with more information and a greater understanding that will help the ongoing debate on how we deal with the past. I'll now hand you over to Louise Melinder. Thanks, Louise. Good morning, everyone. 
Um, before I get started, I also have a couple of announcements to make. Um, firstly, with the exception of one speaker, all our speakers today have agreed this event can be recorded. We will therefore be videoing most of the day, and these recordings will be made available on the project website. The camera will at all times be facing the panel, but during the question and answers, we'll be recording people's voices. So if you decide that you would like any of your contributions during the questions and answers to be removed, please email us after the event, and we will, of course, delete anything that you request. All our contact details are available in the conference pack. Secondly, also in the conference pack, you'll find evaluation forms. We would very much um, like you to complete these forms. As you will see from looking at them, we are not looking just for your feedback on how you feel today's event went, but we want your genuine reflections on what you think the next steps to the project should be, which organizations we should talk to, what sort of information would be useful to your organization. So we would very much like to hear your thoughts on that. And there'll also be time to discuss that in the last session of today's conference. Okay, so you've already heard a bit about the background of this project from Sally. So I'm just gonna run through a little bit of the information. So as you know, this is a partnership between the Law School of Queens, the Transitional Justice Institute, and Healing Through Remembering. And we have independent academic funding from the Arts and Humanities Research Council. This project draws on international comparative research that Professor McAvoy, Professor Dixon, and myself previously conducted in Argentina, Bosnia-Herzegovina, Uganda, Uruguay, and South Africa. In each of those countries, we tried to look at why amnesty laws were introduced, what problems they sought to address. We then looked at how they were implemented, what sort of processes were put in place, what challenges arose. And then we tried to consider what impact those processes had, both on their stated aims, but also on society more broadly. Um, while we were working on that research, developments here in Northern Ireland, particularly the consultative group in the past process, made us think how relevant the findings that we were seeing were to our own jurisdiction. So I'm just going to outline briefly some of those findings. Firstly, politics. We found that the local political context is crucial to the legitimacy or otherwise of an amnesty process that results in perpetrators ev evading full criminal punishment. By that we mean there isn't one size fits all to these amnesty debates. If an amnesty is used, it should be tailored to try and address a particular need in a society at a particular time. Um, related to that is the issue of ownership. Historically, amnesty laws were the product of elite bargains between politicians negotiating behind closed doors. But in some of the societies we looked at, there was a more profound public conversation on the need for and the shape that an amnesty should take. So we found that the extent to which there is a public conversation on the amnesty and, and whether prosecutions are in the public interest that includes not only political elites, but also victims, civil society, and competent organizations can be key to the legitimacy of the amnesty process and the extent to which different actors are willing to engage with it. A further theme that came up in our research related to linkages between amnesties and other forms of transitional justice. In some contexts, amnesties have been used as isolated measures designed to prevent any discussion of, of the past. Those amnesties are often the ones that have the greatest challenges in legitimacy and the ones which face sustained um, civil society campaigns. Um, in other contexts, amnesties can be directly tied to the delivery of transitional justice in reparations or participation in restorative justice or truth commission programs. And we found from looking at the different countries that where these linkages exist, it can significantly influence the social and political reaction to an amnesty. And then finally, and I think perhaps most relevantly to us, now that we're 50, over 15 years since the Good Friday Agreement, we found that there was an inevitability to these debates. In each of the five countries we looked at, they started from very different positions on the balance between amnesty and prosecutions. In some, blanket amnesties were used to prevent any investigation of past crimes. In others, like Bosnia, a, a expensive, high-profile international tribunal was established to prosecute war crimes. 
But in both cases, as the years progressed, what they found was amnesty by itself wasn't the answer. It couldn't prevent victims continuing to seek justice and truth. But prosecutions by themselves weren't the answer either. In the wake of mass crimes, there's too many challenges for prosecutions to deal with. So we found that as the years passed, the, the balance between amnesty and accountability was often subject to negotiation. So that's some of the context that gave rise to this current project. And so in this project, we're trying to do a number of things. Firstly, we want to listen to the views and learn from individuals, groups, or institutions who are concerned with dealing with the past here in Northern Ireland. And we're trying to inform debates in Northern Ireland on amnesties, prosecutions, and the public interest. The information that we pro will provide draws on our international research, and we're trying to um, focus on the international, historical, and legal context of the debates in our own jurisdiction. And we're trying to contribute to people making up their own mind from an informed position on how best to deal with the past. Um, in the months since the project started, we've been engaged in a number of activities. Most notably, we have conducted 18 private meetings with victims, civil society organizations, ex-combatants, government agencies, and lawyers. We've also held one previous public event with the Commission for Victims and Survivors. And these meetings are ongoing. And I just want to emphasize we are open to invitations. If you think that your organization would benefit from a discussion of any of the issues raised today and you'd like us to come and meet your members or your staff, please contact us. We'd be more than willing to do that. In addition to the program of events, uh, we also intend that all project results be made publicly available through the media and blogs and the proje project report. Okay. In my remaining time, I'm going to focus mostly on the debate here in Northern Ireland about the role that amnesty could play in our transition. And then the, uh, towards the end, I'm going to just discuss briefly some of the challenges of pursuing historical prosecutions. Before focusing on the issues here in Northern Ireland, I think it's useful to make some general comments about amnesty laws. One thing that's been interesting is in the private meetings we've held to date, our, some of our uh, um, people we've talked to have described the amnesty issue here as toxic, politically contentious. People want to steer clear of it, or if they do discuss it, it provokes strong, divisive reactions. But we found from looking at other countries that amnesty is used in very different ways in, in different parts of the world. Of course, there are instances where amnesty is used to create impunity for past crimes. But in other instances, say for example, where people have been unjustly imprisoned by a repressive regime, amnesty is a form of reparations in that it seeks to release those people. In other contexts, amnesty is a means to an end. It's a way of encouraging people to come forward and tell the truth about different actions. So amnesties can take very different forms and have very different consequences depending on how they're designed. A core element of an amnesty, though, is that it is designed to remove criminal liability for specified categories of offenders or offenses. This means that amnesties are generally limited. They don't apply to everybody who committed crimes before a particular date, usually. Instead, they're targeted towards particular groups. Another increasingly common feature of amnesties is that they're conditional. This means that in order to benefit from an amnesty, individual offenders or organizations are required to perform particular conditions. These conditions could be, for example, that they surrender weapons, that they disband their organization, that they participate in transitional justice programs, particularly truth recovery, or that they refrain from future actions, such as committing further political or violent offenses. Um, what we'll see in a few moments is that amnesties, or what I'm loosely calling amnesty-like measures, have, have had some of these conditions attached in Northern Ireland to date. So now just to make a few brief remarks about the legal status of amnesties. Here, I'm focusing primarily on the case law of the European Court of Human Rights in relation to Article 2, which relates to violations of the right to life. I'm focusing on this issue because, as yet, the Court has not ruled directly on the question of amnesties, but where it has considered Article 2, it's provided some of the most detailed guidelines on 
the measures that should be taken to deal with the past. So what we found in the court's jurisprudence so far is that Article 2 creates procedural obligations on states. This means that a state must conduct full, effective, prompt, and open investigations. But there is no requirement in the court's case law that these investigations must lead to prosecutions. This is something that's been repeatedly stated in the court's jurisprudence on Northern Ireland and other jurisdictions. And in some cases, like the Finucane case, the court has taken um, the time to acknowledge some of the difficulties inherent in pursuing investigations and prosecutions for historical crimes. Also, in a more recent case on Brecknell, the court stated there is, ab there is no absolute right to obtain a prosecution or conviction. And in a more recent case relating to Croatia, which, in which the amnesty law in Croatia wasn't really the subject of the complaint, so the court just made these remarks in passing, the court stated, the state is justified in enacting any amnesty laws it might consider necessary, provided a balance is maintained between the legitimate interests of the state and the interests of individual members of the public. So what does that mean for us here? if you're considering amnesty laws. Well, I think it does suggest that in some circumstances, amnesties and other forms of leniency are permitted under the European Convention on Human Rights. But I think it's also clear that any amnesties introduced must not prevent investigations. Also, the suggestion that the, the interests of individual members of the public should be considered suggests that victims' interests must be considered on decisions to grant amnesty. But victims don't have a veto in those choices under the European Convention on Human Rights Standards. And I think just as a final passing comment, just as the court has not issued a direct statement on the status of amnesties in relation to violations of Article 2, it has not yet made any strong statements about amnesties and Article 3 either. Article 3 relates to the prohibition on torture. But there have been a few recent cases where the court in passing has suggested that it might take a more restrictive stand for torture. And I think the reason for that difference is that in some circumstances, it's acknowledged under international human rights law that the state can engage in the use of lethal force but in no circumstances can a state torture. And torture is not just a human rights violation, it's widely regarded as an international crime which triggers individual criminal responsibility. Um, now, moving on to how amnesties have been used here in Northern Ireland. I think amnesties were first used in relation to the troubles in 1969. This wasn't a law that was enacted, it was a policy of the Stormont Executive, and it was introduced in a context of growing civil unrest to try and quell the, the, um, the violence that was beginning. And this covered events associated with this unrest, but committed between October 1968 and May 1969. Interestingly, the amnesty covered both civilians and members of the RUC. One of the most high-profile beneficiaries of this amnesty was Ian Paisley. That's why he's on the slide there. Um, I think also, significantly, this amnesty applied to criminal proceedings that were pending, C future criminal proceedings, meaning ones that had not even been launched at the time of the amnesty's announcement, and it applied to people who'd already been convicted. So the same measure was both an amnesty for people who'd not been convicted and a pardon for those who had and the amnesty was granted unconditionally. More recently, once the peace negotiations began, amnesty measures were used as part of the decommissioning scheme. In the legislation that reg regulated that scheme, it provided that no proceedings will be brought in respect of anything done in accordance with the decommissioning scheme, such as moving weapons, and it stated that decommissioned articles or evidence from them cannot be used in criminal proceedings. Initially, this amnesty was to last for 12 months, but it was renewed continually by the Secretary of State until 2010. We also had um, le forms of leniency in the early release scheme. Um, this scheme provided for the release of qualifying prisoners. This meant persons who were convicted of scheduled offences and who belonged to paramilitary organisations on ceasefire. Under the scheme, they were to be released within two years of the legislation being passed. 
where they were released, they released neither time limited or permanent licenses. So this measure differs from classic understandings of amnesty in that it applied only to people who'd been convicted and that they were released on license. Between 1998 and the end of March 2012, 482 qualifying prisoners were released in Northern Ireland, and of those, 21 were, um, had their licenses suspended. That's a recidivism rate of 4%, which is hugely lower than it would be for ordinary offenders. Um, this scheme also applies to paramilitaries who are convicted after 1998, and it's a point I'll come back to you later. It does not apply, however, to state forces. So if, if anybody who worked for the state was convicted today of crimes committed during the Troubles, they would, they would be liable to serve their full sentence unless they were released on license or pardoned in a similar manner that would apply to ordinary offenders. So we've seen that over, the amnesty style measures used in different ways to try and encourage um, pacification where civil unrest was breaking out, to encourage individuals to surrender their weapons, and to try and facilitate difficult aspects of the peace agreement through the release of political prisoners. One further way in which amnesty style measures have been used here is to incentivize testimony. And I think in our present context, this is perhaps the most important, both because we have a lot of different truth recovery processes ongoing, and also because of the standards created by Article 2 of the European Convention on Human Rights. So amnesty style measures have been used as part of the location of victims' remains process, where evidence provided is confidential and cannot be used in criminal proceedings. And I think Jeff Knapfer is going to talk about that more this morning. It's also been part of the Bloody Sunday inquiry, in which any written or oral evidence given by witnesses could not be used against them although it could be used to prosecute others. And incentivizing testimony was part of the recommendations for the consultative group in the past. In each of these proposals, it was felt that it was necessary to offer some form of immunity to encourage offenders to come forward and give information. So now, just in the last couple of slides, I want to flag a couple of the difficulties, or some of the difficulties associated with historical prosecutions. To give an illustration of this, I'm going to use this quote by Hugh Ward, which he relates to a statement he made at the time of the establishment of the historical inquiries team. So he said, the likelihood of solving cases was clearly going to be slight. Witnesses would be old or dead. Exhibits, if still available, could be contaminated or inadmissible. Informants and agents would be in the mix. The original paperwork, incomplete, were missing. At the height of the troubles, 497 people were murdered in one year. The forensic laboratory was blown up twice. Numerous police stations were blown up, a station, a stations housing much of the investigative material. The fact that evidential opportunities lost at the time would be hard to recover did not render the initiative worthless. We had to shift the focus to ensure that, mindful of our primary role as investigators, the driving force behind this initiative would be to deliver a meaningful outcome to their families. So that quote gives you a sense of scale of the problems faced by criminal investigators trying to look at um, crimes committed during the Troubles. And just to run down some of these, um, eyewitness evidence may be unavailable or unreliable. There might be a lack of usable forensic evidence, particularly where evidence has become contaminated in the years since the crime was committed. And the investigations may be contaminated by agents, as you saw in the Denon Stonson case. There is also the challenges of the unreliability of assisting offender evidence. We saw this most notably in the collapse of the recent Supergrass trials, but also in the decision not to pursue prosecutions in the Martin O'Hagan case. Also, if anybody is convicted today of crimes or any, um, any paramilitary offences committed before 1998, under the early release scheme, they will only serve a maximum of two years imprisonment. So just to conclude, um, this project is designed to inform the debate and let people make decisions from a position of knowledge. Knowledge of the international, the legal and the historical context of amnesties, prosecutions, and truth recovery. What we found from our research to date is that almost all transitional jurisdictions at different times have deployed a combination of amnesties and prosecutions. So part of our job with regard to Northern Ireland is to explore the difficulties and advantages of both. And while some form of 
whilst truth without some form of amnesty is difficult to envisage, and historical prosecutions are difficult to achieve, neither product should be oversold. Okay, um, as you'd have seen from the agenda, we're going to move directly into the next panel now. So if anybody has any questions on the project as a whole or, or on this presentation, there will be time to discuss that in the last session of today's conference. Um, okay, if I can invite the panelists for the next panel to come to the stage. Thank you. <laughs>